Okay, testing one, two, three. Welcome to the program. Hello, David. Good to be with you as always. Well, I want to talk about um, revolt here and there and the uh, revolt in the Arab Middle East, which seemingly took the world by surprise uh, beginning in uh, December of 2010 in Tunisia. But before we talk about what's happened in the last year, uh, if you could set the context of the post-colonial, post-imperial um, uh, Arab states. Essentially, what happened in the Arab world after the Second World War, or in the decades following the Second World War, was that the weakening of the British and French empires made it very difficult for them to exercise any real control. So it was only a question of time. Saudi Arabia had already been sorted out during the Second World War itself when Roosevelt and the American government took charge of the kingdom uh, and without a word of thank you to the British. And Saudi Arabia was then safe with the United States and has remained so till today. In Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Let's take these three countries to start with. We had European empires still exercising an influence, British troops present, the Suez Canal owned by the West. And then we had the beginning of a set of revolutions, often led by the military, but supported by a large section of the population. The toppling of King Farouk in Egypt by Gamal Abdel Nasser and the free officers transformed that world. It wouldn't have transformed it had Nasser not decided to nationalize the Suez Canal. That was the key decision which he took in the interests of his country. And by taking that decision, he slapped the face of the European empires, which is why the United States weren't that concerned with it. They were not directly affected. And the British response to the nationalization of the Suez Canal was to prepare an invasion of Egypt. And Britain, France, and Israel, uh, the dilapidated British lion, mm, helped by the French fox and the Israeli skunk launched a three-part attack on this country and the entire Arab world gasped and the Egyptians of course fought back but the key player and one has to recognize this was the United States they were they had not been asked permission before this happened it was a critical moment in the Cold War. They didn't want Nasser to fall into the arms of the Soviet Union, and they thought that the British and French were driving him in that direction. And that was the last time the British and the French ever did anything major without asking the permission of the United States. So the Suez invasion was created the birth of a Arab nationalism, at the same time, it marked the total end of the British Empire. I mean, Africa was yet to be given its independence, but that came to an end. And Nasser, of course, treated the triumph in uh, Egypt, the Suez Canal remained under Egyptian control, as a lesson for the Arabs that this is the way you go forward. You fight, you take actions, and a huge nationalist wave engulfed that world. And there were times when people felt that we could have a common Arab nation with three concurrent capitals, Cairo, Damascus, Baghdad, because in 1958 there was a revolution in Iraq and the pro-British regime wiped out. Monarch, the king was actually, and his horrific uh, uncle, the crown prince, were publicly hanged. Uh, in Egypt, the monarchy was, had been toppled, so uh, the, the crown heads of the Arab world were shaking, tottering. And it was an incredible mood, which I remember well as a young person uh, growing up at the time. We were excited by it. 
Then what happened is, of course, the Israelis that were now central to U.S. strategy. They didn't want to use the European powers. The Americans were there in Saudi Arabia themselves and more or less in the Gulf, though not to the extent to which they are now. And the Israelis became the central players on behalf of the United States. The 1967 war was a decisive war for a number of reasons. A, the defeat inflicted by the Israeli army on the Egyptians and the Syrians marked the end of the nationalist phase in Arab politics. It never recovered from that. They were backed by the West, particularly by the United States, and the United States, impressed by the skill and ease with which the Israelis had punished Arab nationalism, became friends for life. It was 67, not 48. 48 was important for the formation of Israel, backed by the United States and Britain, but it's not till 1967 that the United States really embraced Israel. And from now it was my house is your house between these two state powers. And that then saw Nasser died soon afterwards, and the by the early 70s, the United States were pu pushing Nasser's successor, uh, Anwar Sadat, to be a big boy and do the deal with Israel, because they felt that Egypt is the most important state, the most powerful state, both in terms of population and military force, was needed in order to end this confrontation with Israel. And so the Israeli-Egyptian peace accord was signed, and of course both these roles, Anwar al-Sadat and uh, Menachem Begin, got the Nobel Peace Prize. Hardly a surprise. Uh, and it was the Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir who made a memorable remark at that time when she said, when she was asked, what do you think of these two guys getting the Peace Prize? She said it's the wrong prize, they deserved an Oscar because they acted so well. And I think what we uh, saw with the emergence of the Sadat government was both a total capitulation to Israel in terms of foreign policy. It was a humiliating peace treaty for Egypt, saying that its armies couldn't move freely within Egyptian borders without the Israelis being informed beforehand. All sorts of crazy stuff. And it meant the abandonment of the Palestinians by the Egyptian state. And thirdly, it meant for Egypt now entering the embrace not just of Israel, but of the West. So all the progressive reforms of Nasser were dismantled. And by the 80s, the process of privatization, which we are now very familiar with, had begun. The removal of the social safety net Islamist groups were used by Sadat to victimize, repress, and destroy the nationalist presence on the campuses. Quite horrible stories came out at that time. And they created what became the Egypt we know till the uprising. Uh, Rock-solid, hard dictatorship based on repression. But the peace treaty split Sadat's supporters within the Islamist ranks, and the group is, which finally bumped him off uh, cited that as a key reason why they, they had bumped him off. Uh, and the, his uh, death was not as unpopular as was painted in the Western press, despite the people who carried it out. Many Egyptians said, thank God this has happened. Uh, Mubarak was present when Sadat was killed, but he was, uh, you know, very quick in hiding under the table. Well, correctly, he saved his life, and he succeeded Sadat, and he moderated things a tiny bit, but by within a few years, he was back on track, doing exactly the same things, and far more repressive than even Sadat had been. And so we saw the emergence of this dictatorship, which became more and more maltreated, but had to rely largely on repression to maintain order 
and largely to rely on American largesse, billions in uh, 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 aid, so-called, which went largely to the military and the elite, in order to stay in power. So that was the combination that did it. And we know now for the last 10 years that tensions had been building. First, with the Islamists, uh, Mubarak applied a double-edged policy with them. Don't challenge me frontally on the political domain and I'll make lots of concessions to you culturally. And that is what he did, which actually made them stronger. Uh, and they didn't challenge him politically. I remember, David, I was in Cairo in 2002, meeting a leader of the Brotherhood who was a doctor in his... Um, doctor's uh, clinic uh, because they were illegal and I said what are you guys going to do when the Americans invade Iraq and he said brother Tarak let me tell you this the gates of hell will open Yanni I said well I look forward to it because <laughs> you could actually play a very big part if Egypt goes up it will be difficult don't you worry of course, when Iraq was invaded, nothing happened. No gates opened up of hell or heaven or anything else. And we saw uh, <clears throat> very little uh, in that country. I mean, so the Brotherhood essentially, um, you know, was repressed. Many of its militants were tortured, but less and less. Largely, what's his name, um, Mubarak, uh, threatened them because he knew a lot of Muslim Brotherhood supporters were businessmen. So every time they did something he didn't like, he'd say, okay, we'll take all your licenses away. So immediately a section of the Brotherhood leadership would fall back into line. The young who were being recruited were more militant. But what we are talking about now is the basically the only serious political organization that existed in Egypt in these years, because a huge vacuum had been created by the destruction of the nationalists. They were beaten, um, they had their tail between their legs, they did very little. They were there, but they did little. And so it was the Brotherhood who was in power when the uprising happened. And what joyous days they were when the young people poured out onto the streets of Cairo and Alexandria and Suez, just challenging uh, the regime on every front and throwing each ball back into its own court. If you want to repress us, you will have to use the army. At the same time, the demonstrators, their young faces filled with hope, fraternizing with the Egyptian military, embracing soldiers and officers, making it very difficult for them to turn the tanks on them. So the combination of this actually led to the toppling of the despot. The Americans finally realized they couldn't keep him in power, though they tried. They tried very hard. Hillary Clinton uh, stated in public Mubarak has been a loyal friend. Why Bill and I regard him as family? Well, of course you do. But the Egyptian people never regarded him as family. Never was this disjuncture between US-backed despots in the Arab world and the bulk of the people so clear as in the streets of Egypt uh, in those months. And they were really days of joy. During that period of Tatters Square, uh, Hillary Clinton also commented that no country has done more for democracy in Egypt than the United States of America. I want to, uh, I would like you to read a poem by uh, Nizad Kabani from your book, The Obama Syndrome, Surrender at, at Home, War Abroad. Uh, first tell us who Kabani is and um, wh what this significance of this poem is. Nizar Kabani was a very great Syrian poet, nationalist in tenor, very sympathetic to socialism and progressive ideas. And um, he died some years ago, about a decade ago now, I think, and got a huge funeral in his native Damascus. He was a Syrian poet, 
very highly respected by everyone in the Arab world. And during the 50s and 60s, many of his poems were sung as songs by the great divas like Um Kalsum and others, which made them very popular with the people too, uh, not just the intelligentsia. And this poem, a bit of which I quoted from, uh, was actually written after the 1967 defeat, when Kebani realized before anyone else, you know, I always say that great poets have a third eye, which can see the future. And Kabani's third eye told him that this generation of leaders, doesn't matter who they are, are finished. So he wrote this poem to the youth of the Arab world, especially the Egyptians, but all young Arabs. Arab children, corners of the future, you will break our chains, kill the opium in our heads, Kill the illusions. Arab children, don't read about our suffocated generation. We are a hopeless case, as worthless as a watermelon rind. Don't read about us. Don't ape us. Don't accept us. Don't accept our ideas. We are a nation of crooks and jugglers. Arab children, spring rain, corners of the future, you are the generation that will overcome defeat. This was written in 1967, and we had to wait a long time, over 40 years, for his words to be proved true. And they still haven't overcome total defeat, but they have overcome partial defeat, these young people. And their sense of political awareness and political consciousness has now reached such a level that it will require a great deal to push them underneath the ground again, as they were, submerge them as they were for most of Mubarak's years. So, Nizar Kabani, like great poets, has proved prescient. Indeed, I was thinking of Fez Ahmed Fez and his poem uh, Bowl, and another one called Hamde Kenge, uh, which freely quoted throughout uh, South Asia today in resistance movements. Well, Faz Ahmed Faz was very dear to me. He was a close friend of my father's, very great poet of the subcontinent. I grew up, you know, seeing him in our house, where often poetry would be recited by him and others. So this was part of our culture. Poets were incredibly important. And one reason that made them important was who they were, and the other reason is that the masses, even if they were literate or semi uh, illiterate or semi literate, instinctively appreciated high quality poetry. I've spoken to people who would sometimes say to me, We don't totally understand what Faz Saab is saying, but he really is a wonderful poet. I mean, the people did understand that, and in these two poems, I I'll never forget, I was at Government College Lahore, we were under a military dictatorship, and the principal of the college, who was a great Punjabi scholar, literary scholar, Dr. Nazir Ahmed, translated all the great Punjabi poets into Urdu. He was a great friend of Faiz, and he invited Faiz to speak at an event. Of course, we knew he was coming, I was there with other students, sitting down in the poet. It was, remember, it was a military dictatorship which had banned all politics, all political parties, all trade unions. A demonstration was punishable with death. We will shoot on the streets, they said, and they did. And Faiz Saab came to the college, and the poem he read was Bol, Kirla Bazaad Hain Tere, Speak for thine two lips are fee, uh, free, Bol ke jaab tak teri hai, Speak while you have still got life inside you. And it went on and on, and we applauded. I mean, I have never rem First people were stunned. And then they applauded. And Ham Dekenge, of course, is a very utopian, beautiful poem, uh, which was read a lot during the uprisings in Pakistan in, in the you know, different periods of its uh, history, in which he just said, 
हम देखेंगे वी विल सी लाजम है हम देखेंगे नेसेसरली वी विल सी द टाइम कमिंग वेन रिप्रेशन एंड ऑपरेशन विल फ्लोट अवे लाइक कॉटन वोल इन द एयर वेन एवरी क्राउन द क्राउन हेड्स विल शेक वेन थ्रोन्स विल ट्रेम्बल एंड ऑल वी विल सी बिफोर आस इज द पीपल द पीपल डिमांडिंग जस्टिस अंडरनीथ द आई ऑफ गॉड you know people used to weep when this poem was read out and uh, it carries on being recited now it's not recited which is partially tragic but it's the world we live in in huge assemblies but it's now goes from one household to the other through youtube someone singing this poem some rare photograph uh, footage of fez reciting it that's how people see it so it hasn't died i i disagree with people who say oh poetry is dead it isn't dead it is just found a different route this is how young people relate to these things today they will not go to a large public mushaira or poetry reading like my generation did we would go to a poetry reading Nine o'clock in the evening after supper, and be there in the morning before breakfast, as the poets were really now getting into extempore uh, 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 poetry. And one particular poet, who was a very right-wing poet, but we had to hear him, and he is the one who wrote the awful national anthem of Pakistan. His name was Afif Chilandri. He had a famous poem, which was a song which he used to sing, ke, which went. uh this was a, by that time he was already decaying and he would sing this song abhi to main jawan hu you know which was his favorite song uh, i am still young and uh, someone would shout from the audience in typical punjabi kehdiya goliyan khanda mein which tablets are you on in that case <laughs> and that that was the lahori crowd very sharp <laughs> and very critical <laughs> uh but it was great fun hearing all this and it's something which i know will never be repeated so it's good that it's kept up however it's uh, kept up and uh, all these poets faiz nizar kabani sadi yusuf dozens of others uh, not to mention all our palestinian friends who wrote poetry and some still do um this will be remembered it's now recorded it can be transferred just overnight to someone else and that's good one of the major historical events in the arab middle east is in takes place in 1969 when colonel muhammad qaddafi overthrows the monarchy of uh, king idris uh, throws out the us uh, air force base wheeler air force base and uh, becomes as in the case of Saddam Hussein in uh, Iraq and in Syria with Assad pair and fees a national security state built around the great leader uh, fossilizing uh, concentrating wealth corruption yada 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 the story is well known he meets uh, his end in 2011 now you were very critical of the NATO intervention in Libya you called it a vigil a vigilante uh action um how do you see now in retrospect this whole rationale that was created by the Obama administration under the rubric of <coughs> responsibility to protect well let me say on that that the responsibility to protect has probably led to more deaths than the number of people they were protecting in Benghazi as they were saying you know we have had over 6 months of continuous bombing of libyan cities tripoli sirte uh, misrati others very few images of these bomb cities have been permitted onto the television screens unlike in iraq where they were showing how strong they were even that amount of coverage al jazeera didn't do it because their government was backing the nato invasion so al jazeera's coverage was totally pro war and it has declined considerably so one can't just attack the western media the one independent television station we had is in its death throes as a result of this but to come back to your central point 6 months of bombing david and they are saying there were hardly any casualties i don't believe it 
I was speaking to someone who shall be nameless, who is well informed and linked to more people who do know these things in Britain, and I said, how many people have you guys killed? About 40, 50,000? He said, no, not that many. I said, how many? Give me a rough estimate. He said, probably 20,000. Now, it could be 20, it could be 30, because the notion that these are, this is precision bombing is just a nonsense. You know, they can't even do that with their drone attacks in Pakistan. So I would say that that is probably the case, though I hasten to add that I, we have no proof of this so far. Uh, very little reporting has gone on. Uh, the journalists were mainly embedded. No one actually sent in the reports which we saw uh, during the Iraq war, both through Al Jazeera and through Fisk and others. So we haven't had that in this particular war. Uh, so if this is the case that they've killed twenty to 30,000 people, then what does it show? It shows total, pure cynicism. Essentially, why they went into Libya, the uh, Euro-American uh, complement of NATO, was to take it. Uh, they had been negotiating with Gaddafi for the last 15 years, or, yeah, 10, 12 years, uh, to bring him into the fold. They had brought him into the fold. Condoleezza Rice had publicly stated that Gaddafi was a model for the Arab world as a modernist dictator. Uh, Tony Blair fell into his arms. A lot of money exchanged hands. That is always the case with Blair. Nothing is free. And they, the British media began to extol this guy as a statesman. You know, this is very similar to what we're doing in Britain. We call it the third way, and it's your third way. This is the extent of collaboration with him. And, and Gaddafi said, uh, when the West decided to start to attack him, Gaddafi's son gave a press conference and said, we funded Sarkozy's election campaign. Now, it could well be true. So this was the degree of collaboration between these people, and suddenly he becomes, becomes a monster because there's an uprising against him. Give me a break. Essentially, I think they took Libya to win it as a market for investments, for the oil. Libyan oil is very good quality, produced at very cheap cost. Um, wreck the Libyan coast with tourist hotels. Um, you know, take their business there. That's why I think they did it, just to get rid of a guy who was just dragging his feet, even though he'd agreed to do it. And of course, he humiliated them, you know, by arriving in Paris and Rome and saying he wanted to set up his stupid tent in the middle of the city, just making fun of the Western leaders, because he was a slightly eccentric, unlike Saddam and Assad, who were brutes, but they were not eccentric. They were not. The Gaddafi always had his eccentric side to him. He was very, very poorly educated. He was 22 when that coup took place and worshipped uh, Nasser of Egypt at the time. But then he soon forgot him. So uh, that is essentially what happened, and it's not over yet. Because ironically, as we see, or perhaps not so ironically, uh, some of the people handed over to Gaddafi to be tortured were handed over by the British and the Americans, as Islamists, Al-Qaeda, all that. Well, one of these guys is commanding the Tripoli militia today, and he's demanding a public apology from the British for having tortured him themselves and then handing him over to Gaddafi. So I think this one isn't totally played out. And I think those people who got very excited and said this is the first NATO intervention which we can support because it's genuinely humanitarian, have to answer questions about the civilian casualties and about what is going to happen to Libya. And David, you know my position on this. I have always said, however horrible it is, it is better that these overthrows are organic, that they take place internally. Sometimes it's a long struggle and lives are lost, but lives are not saved by Western military intervention. I said that in Kosovo during the war on Yugoslavia, and my position hasn't changed on that. 
and for many sort of leftists and former leftists now saying, oh, this was an intervention we can support, you feel they are desperate to come into the fold. We've seen people like that before. This time, I thought the Iraq war would have disabused them, uh, because all the same arguments could be used. Uh, to justify the war in Iraq as they're using against Gaddafi, except that Saddam wasn't doing these things at the time he was attacked. The images of Gaddafi coming out of Libya helped enormously. And one person I know and quite like, a writer, he said, well, you know, if there had been images like that coming out of Iraq before the Iraq war, I would probably have supported the war. People don't even know what they're saying. And they have stopped thinking in serious categories. So humanism, humanitarianism becomes the only serious category, uh, which means they've lost faith in themselves and abandoned their own intellects, many of these people. So I am absolutely, uh, uh, you know, I have no problems with the, the position I took on the war. I think it was completely justified, as we shall see. And what are they going to do if the Islamists in Libya now come to power. I have no problems with that. Better them than some unrepresentative person. That's the way people will learn from their own experiences. In Tunisia, in Libya, in Egypt, you have Islamists in power. Fine. Do business with them. See what they're like. If you don't like them, push them aside. Form something new. Always the best way. But the West might not be so sanguine. In fact, in elections in Tunisia, neighboring uh, Tunisia in late October 2011, what's described as a moderate Islamist formation uh, won the election. Exactly. Uh, the Turkish Islamists won the Turkish elections years ago and are now a pillar of the so-called international community, i.e. Uh, supported by the State Department, NATO's favorite Islamists. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the bulk of it will do a deal. We know what's going on behind the scenes is three-way discussions between the United States, the Brotherhood, and the Egyptian army to work out some compromise settlement. In Tunisia, Ghanoushi's party has won the elections, and we will see, because when he was in Britain in exile, he was saying that he believed in social justice and all this sort of stuff. So we'll see uh, whether they do anything socially beneficial to their people or just open the country up to more investment. So essentially you have the same regime but with a democratic side to it, which is, you know, not unimportant. Uh, and, um, you know, the, it's, it's what, what we were talking about earlier. When you create a vacuum, that's when the Islamists come. Someone fills the vacuum. The left can't do it. The progressive forces don't exist or are demoralized or are backing the United States in the case of Iraq and Afghanistan. And so the Islamists seem to be the only party, serious opposition party. Um, so we will see. I mean, in, in Tunisia, a few leftists have been elected to parliament as well, I gather. So we'll see what they do and what they can do. And this term, responsibility to protect, is applied quite selectively. Obviously, some citizens of the world are more privileged than other citizens. Clearly, uh, Kashmiris who are living in Indian-administered Kashmir, who have died in the many, many thousands, the actual figure is 70,000, since an uprising there in 1989, do not fall under this category of responsibility to protect. And uh, England and France and the European powers in the United States are not very exercised about what's happening uh, to that, that particular population. No, the West basically doesn't care a damn about Kashmir. And the fact that 70,000 people have died thus demographically interfering with the proportions of the population in Kashmir in relationship to Muslims and Hindus, um, and the fact that it's been a brutal intervention by the Indians, much, much worse, David, let me add, in terms of numbers killed, than anything the Chinese have done in Tibet. That's the comparison. The minute there's trouble in Tibet, the whole Western media is up in arms and all the Buddhists in Hollywood start making movies. Okay? When the Indians carry out repressions on a huge scale in Kashmir, much worse than Tibet, silence. And so the logic is, I think, of this, that if a country is formally democratic, 
it can do whatever it wants. But if it's not democratic, then we can use the fact that it's not democratic as a weapon against it. Otherwise, there's nothing. I mean, people are people. Um, you know, the United States and its allies have occupied Iraq. They say they're about to leave. Good. Good riddance. But they've occupied Iraq and a million, over a million people have died. Who is going to be charged with those war crimes? I mean, Bush, Cheney, Blair, Aznar. They should be before some court as war criminals. No one will charge them. So double standards are part of the world uh, we live in. And the reason for that is that in the majority countries of the world, the only truly sovereign country is the United States of America. American sovereignty is determined by the United States. Everyone else's, or not everyone else's, but certainly Europe and the Middle East countries' sovereignty is determined by the United States. Uh, that's the big difference. And so they all fall into line whenever the U.S. says, you know, this has to be done, that has to be done. The Germans sometimes don't. They don't send troops, but then they fall into line after. The Germans refuse to fight in Iraq. They refuse to fight in, uh, in Libya. They sent troops to Afghanistan, which created a huge debate within the German elite. Uh, they don't do it, but they don't oppose it either. So, you know, the, 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 the real sovereign nation today in the world is the imperial nation. The Chinese are sovereign, but that's, you know, in their own region and economically, and they never challenged the United States militarily either. I mean, the first time they did it recently was to oppose sanctions against Syria in the UN Security Council, and the reason for that is that both the Russians and the Chinese feel they were tricked into supporting the UNSC resolution on Libya, because they said this would be a limited exercise just utilized to prevent Gaddafi from bombing Benghazi. That's why we supported it, and they, these people are misusing it, so we are not supporting it. But that's the first sign of some rift, and I don't think that's too serious either. Indeed, uh, a no-fly zone quickly became a regime change uh, in terms of policy. Talk about uh, the role, the evolving role of NATO, and some have said it has become... Uh, a military arm of the empire of Washington. It is. I mean, NATO, which never fought a single war during the Cold War, when it was created to combat the so-called Soviet threat to Western Europe, it never fought. But since the collapse of communism and the death of the Soviet Union, NATO suddenly become very active. And I think its function is, is one of the possible means for the United States to change a regime or get its way in the world. And I can't remember which American official it was, but was very blunt about it. He said, you know, we're not that bothered. I mean, if we can use the UN, we'll use the UN. If we can't use the UN, we'll use NATO. If we can't use NATO, we'll go in ourselves. And in Iraq, they couldn't use the UN or NATO, so they went in themselves with the coalition of the willing. Um, and that was that. I can't, you know, one can't take these institutions too seriously, David. I mean, all these institutions, military, international, financial, are by and large institutions which are created by and respond to the United States. You know, that is just a fact of life. And when people tell me the American empire is weakening, I say, well, it is in some cases economically, but its military and institutional stranglehold remains quite strong. Don't underestimate that. Talk a bit about your native Pakistan, which seems to... Uh, careen from one disaster to another, <clears throat> to ongoing catastrophes, to floods, to uh, internal uh, uh, poverty on a, on a massive scale. Where is Pakistan going? I mean, years ago you wrote a book about, you know, will Pakistan survive? And that was in the early 80s. It's still there. It has, sh as a state, it has shown some resilience in terms of staying power. But how much pounding can the population take? 
The state of Pakistan now, David, makes me weep. I have analyzed it, I have written about it, I have done three books on it, I have written numerous essays on it. I sometimes feel I have there's very little left to say. One has said it all, and just repeating oneself, what good is it going to do? But, you know, what do we have in this country? Natural catastrophes are one thing. Earthquakes, floods, okay, every country can suffer from them. We have man-made catastrophes in Pakistan. Uh, people, it's, the army is one problem, which has never let that country grow up in peace uh, by taking over, again on the instructions of the United States, at critical moments in the country's history. Every single coup was green-lighted by the United States. Ayub Khan and Zia al Ayub Khan in 1958 took power because he and the Americans felt that if a f country's first general election was permitted in April 1959, parties which wanted to pull Pakistan out of the security pacts into which this elite had taken them would be, might take them out of the pact, because Nehru's non-alignment and neutral neutrality was popular. Uh, so they said best not to permit an election, do it. Then, in 1977, Bhutto took power, and the first martial law ultimately led to the breakup of the country in 1971, with East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh. Uh, then we had General Zia's coup d'etat, which in some ways was equally damaging. Ayub uh, broke up Pakistan, and General Zia totally destroyed the political fabric and culture of Pakistan by instituting public floggings, public hangings, executing the country's last elected prime minister, and doing all this with a cover of Islamism, Islamic laws, women's rights being taken away, and an ugly atmosphere built up in the country from which it is still suffering, and all that was tolerated because General Zia had become an indispensable ally in the war against the Russians in Afghanistan. Bhutto, one reason for the Americans not doing anything to save his life was because he had basically refused to stop building the nuclear bomb. Kissinger warned him, if you don't desist, we will make a terrible example out of you, and Bhutto replied in kind. Uh, but that's what they did. They made a terrible example out of him. But then General Zia, their favoured successor, was the one who completed Bhutto's work and built the bomb. Because what the United States failed to perceive was that whatever, whoever was running the country, once India had nuclear weapons, no section of the Pakistani military elite was going to say, don't do it. Um, and so Zia, under you know, with the Americans turning a blind eye, built the nuclear weapons just as he was helping them in Afghanistan to defeat the Russians. So that nuclear weapon became, I think, of, you, you know, you said I wrote, can Pakistan survive? I did have a question mark. But I, I noted in that book in 1984 all the symptoms of Pakistani collapse. They are still there, but what is keeping them together, the spinal cord of the Pakistani state now, is a military with nuclear weapons. That makes it very difficult to destroy the country. I mean, the United States still could if they wanted to, but the price would be high, very high. Uh, the United States themselves do not know where all the nuclear weapons are. They think they do, or may I am sure they know they don't. Some of them have been hidden in parts which are known to very few people, only trusted people. So, I mean, you know, that's an ongoing situation. Meanwhile, we have so-called democracy with a politician in power who is the widower of Benazir Bhutto, who was killed fighting an election campaign. And in characteristic South Asian fact fashion, uh, except she was more blatant about it, said that I leave my party to the care of my son until he comes of age his husband. This is sort of medieval practice, you know, going back to the days of the monarchies of old. And even then, the Mughal emperors usually avoided specifying which kid would succeed them because they didn't want to have a civil war on their hands, so sometimes they did. She was very specific. 
and so the so-called princess of democracy, as American papers called her, actually bequeathed her party to her family. It became The party became a family heirloom. And for Zardari, he, to be fair to him, has never made a secret of the fact that his only interest in politics is making money. He's there to make money. And as president of Pakistan, you can make more money than you could if you're the husband of the prime minister. You know, or a minister. He did a lot in those days. But so we have a president who is probably one of the most corrupt leaders in the world, though there's a lot of competition, as you know, in these matters. But he is. And there are hundreds of stories from every quarter on how he makes the money. And so when the floods took place, immediately Zadari's sister appealed to Karachi businessmen saying, I'm, we are setting up an appeal in the name of the Bhutto children, donate to the Bhutto fund. And the businessman, for once, one after the other, stood up and said, you tell us what is needed, cement, rice, clothes, medicines, you give us the locations where they are needed, we will buy them, make them available to the people who are suffering. We are not going to put them in any fund public rebuff. She walked out of that meeting. So everyone knows what's going on and people are helpless and conditions get worse and worse. On one border in the northern flank of the country we have the Afghanistan war. We have the war spilling over into Pakistan as I had predicted in October 2001 this was going to happen. We have Balochistan. Balochistan, the military creating trouble in Balochistan and the Baloch leaders going to the American embassy and pleading for support to create an independent Balochistan. Both sides just completely bankrupt. And then we have the drone attacks on Pakistan, which uh, in Obama's two and a half years in office, there have been more drone attacks than in Bush's entire term of office. Uh, I was wondering if you see any, see any parallels between uh, the rhetoric that, the, that Washington is leveling against uh, Pakistan and what they were saying about Cambodia in the 1960s, as Cambodia was a safe haven, uh, it was uh, making it impossible for the United States to achieve victory uh, in Vietnam, uh, cross-border raids were launched, and ultimately a full-scale invasion took place in uh, early 1970. Uh, there have been very bellicose and uh, militant messages coming from uh, Washington, from the State Department, as well as the uh, former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, that Pakistan is playing a double game. Uh, it is harboring the Haqqani network. Uh, it is uh, basically uh, supporting indirectly uh, the Taliban. What are the po prospects of a major U.S. invasion of Pakistan? I think they are very low, and I think the reason for that is that the American military will not want to get bogged down in another country. Pakistan isn't a small country. Uh, Afghanistan is a population of 26 million. Pakistan is a population approaching, if it hasn't already reached, 200 million. You invade a country like Pakistan, and you have a huge confrontation on your hands. Uh, so I don't think the Pentagon is going to permit that, just as the Pentagon has been very hostile to any bombing raids on Iran, which have been, you know, don't forget how bellicose they've been, and how recently they tried to use this absurd manufactured incident of total absurd, the President of the United States himself comes on air to tell people we have discovered a huge plot which is some nutty fantasist is going to kill the Saudi ambassador and this nutty fantasist has been employed by the Iranians. Give us a break. <laughs> Everyone in Iran was laughing. I mean, they know that had, if we wanted to do this, the Iranians have their own methods of carrying out these attacks if they wish to. And why kill this little punk in the Washington embassy? Who is he? He's just an ambassador. Nothing. He changes nothing. Just a provocation to try and turn the heat on Iran. Utterly pathetic. In the case of Pakistan, of course, it is uh, more serious for them, but they know it. It's not a surprise, and they know perfectly well that the Pakistani state, for its own reasons, whether you like it or, or not, 
are not going to permit Afghanistan to be handed over to the Indians. The Karzai puppets are desperately negotiating with India, also for troops. Uh, and Pakistani military intelligence is, is aware of this. So the Haqqani thing, which without doubt was approved, not just by the ISI, David, but by the Pakistani military high command, because this notion that the ISI is a force unto itself is rubbish. It's been cleared up. It never was. The only period it was was when the Americans created it enlarged its size to fight the war in Afghanistan. That's the only time it had a relative autonomy. The war in the 1980s. The, the war in the 19. Jihad. The war in the 1980s. The jihad against the Soviet Union. That's the only time the ISI had a semi-autonomous role. Since that time, it's been cleared up. Obviously, occasionally, certain rogue officers act without permission. But by and large, the ISI is a disciplined unit of the Pakistani military. So whenever people say ISI, it's a code word for not attacking the Pakistani military directly. And that should be understood. Uh, so what happened was that, yeah, they unleashed Haqqani's group to show Afghans, here we are in the middle of the Kabul, chucking bombs and firing on the American embassy and the NATO headquarters for 20 hours? So why couldn't you stop it? That's what the annoyance was, not that it was a military threat as such, but the psychological and political effect of this was like the Vietnamese National Liberation Front taking the American embassy in 68 during the Tet Offensive, occupying it, being killed, but putting the NLF flag up on the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. That was it. The symbolism actually meant something. This was a similar attack by very different people. But the symbolism, the military symbolism, was not so different. And that is why the anger in the United States, especially from Petraeus and others who feel that this war can be won, and who says these wars will go on forever, my children will grow up and these wars are going on. Well, the Afghans don't agree with him. And so the size of the insurgency has been growing. And this was Pakistan firing a shot across Karzai and the Americans' bows and saying, hey guys, don't think you can ignore us in all this hanky-panky that's going on with the Indians behind our back. We know. That is what it was to deal with. It was an attempt to assert their place in the post-withdrawal settlement. Let's transition now and talk about the economic crash uh, hammering the United States and Europe. How did we get here? We got here through the big changes that were made in uh, the 90s, the so-called Washington Consensus, which had two sides to it. One, we no longer face any ideological threat from any part of the world. The Soviet Union has been destroyed. Uh, its presence that posed a threat, even that presence is now gone, it doesn't exist. And the Chinese are our allies, they've, they've been our allies for some time, they've been developing capitalism, we're investing, they've got a huge labor force, they can produce things much cheaper than we can. So why shouldn't our firms and industries and capitalists depend on cheap Chinese labor to get cheap goods into the shops and we will invest money to make more money. In other words, capital now is not going to be productive capital at all, but capital is going to be used for financial speculation. That is what happened to the capitalist system essentially in the turbocharged phase of globalization, which is now in huge crisis. And because, as I said to you earlier, what the United States says, it's acolytes do. And the United States went on this path themselves, and so did the Europeans. The British were the most slavish uh, mimics of this, and the British economy is now in serious trouble. They used to boast that the city of London, you had more freedom to do what you want without regulation. In other words, saying the city of London is the Guantanamo of world capitalism. Come here, you can get away with anything. And <clears throat> they did it. 
But, you know, many economists had been predicting that this couldn't uh, last, principally among them, I have to say, Robert Brenner at the University of California uh, wrote a huge essay uh, in the New Left Review, which subsequently became a book called The Turbulence of the Global Economy, which more or less predicted that this crisis of profits was going to really create very huge damage. The speculative character of... Uh, of, of finance capital in this last period of 20-25 years created a situation where casino capitalism, gambling with money, that's what happened. It essentially was the casino economy. You know, throw a billion here and we might make five billion or we might lose it all. Who cares? And it's not our money anyway. It's the money of shareholders and stockholders and people who've entrusted you with mortgages, pension funds. All that money was used as capital to gamble with. And they got their comeuppance in 2008 when the Wall Street system went into deep crisis. Now, here was a key moment in world history for the United States as the leader of the capitalist world to say, guys, OK, enough's enough. We are now going to make a change. And this state, which is bailing out the banks and the rich, can be used for other purposes too. And we're going to encourage a massive social expenditure, building works, creation of jobs, transforming the face of America by creating a public transport system, employing people to build the railway. All that could have been done. But you had a president who came from a system uh, which he believed in and which he wouldn't challenge. I mean, in my book, The Obama Syndrome, I point out Obama's life as a young Chicago senator in the Illinois Assembly, where he's telling off other African-American Democrats who are attacking the cuts being imposed in Chicago, and Obama is saying to them, we have to learn to be prudent. So this is a man who has remained loyal to that caution, the prudence he talks about, from a you know long time. So this president who'd appointed, who'd got raised most of his money from Wall Street, who could have appointed even you know, Krugman or Stiglitz to be the Treasury Secretary, but appointed Geithner, this president wasn't going to do anything. Wall Street, Goldman Sachs people infiltrated and you know openly the economic establishment under both Bush and uh, Obama. And so that's the system they backed. So essentially what they're creating is a sticking plaster to stem an enormous flow of blood coming from the brain, which is slowly hemorrhaging. And they're putting a sticking plaster on it instead of at least attempting an operation to try and save the patient. So the situation is now quite critical in Europe. Iceland collapsed, Ireland collapsed, Greece collapsed, Spain and Portugal on the verge of collapse, Italy crumbling. Six countries and still no change in politics or policies. And you have to say that either these sons of so-and-sos are incredibly self-confident because they see nothing that can challenge them, uh, or they are blinded and they're going to go under. I mean, Greece, I would say, is in a pre-revolutionary situation. It probably won't happen, but that is my feeling. People are so fed up that they want to do away with the whole bunch. And PASOK centre-left MPs voting for this have been spat on when they've returned to their villages by people on the streets. That's the anger in, in Greece. And so, you know, at long last, you have a occupation movement growing up here. You know, very nice, very well behaved, very angry in some cases. And that's tremendous. It's not enough, David. Not enough to put the pressure that's needed. If general strikes in Greece can't force these people to change course because they're so petrified, you need huge convulsions from below to really turn the tide. And uh, hopefully it will happen. So far, it's not. Nothing else will. But the to come back to your question again, making the Chinese economy the workshop of the world, with Europe free just to spend money, 
borrow money, spend money, consume. That was the model. Consumption through borrowed money, debt. You know, there are kids who will tell you here and in Europe, the banks were chasing them. Please borrow money. You don't, you're not borrowing enough money. Take the money. And the people who did are really suffering now. And uh, for the American economy, this is a huge, huge disaster. And it's no good, the Democrats saying, oh, the Republicans are sabotaging this. You guys had a majority in Senate and House for the first two years of the Obama administration. And they, you know, you can't blame the Republicans. Blame yourselves. Hold up the mirror to yourselves. You did exactly what the Republicans and are saying, why didn't you do different? So it's uh, that's, you know, this sort of image of Obama as a prisoner of right-wing forces is just not credible. It's a sign that the liberals in the United States are so desperate because they, in their hearts they know he's been a disaster, but they can't admit it because to admit it is to admit that they've got nothing. Booms and busts are a regular feature of capitalism over the centuries. Is what we're witnessing now substantively different from previous busts? Uh, no. And I would warn against any notion that capitalism is going to collapse. Uh, capitalism has undergone severe crises in its history. And I think it was the Russian revolutionary Lenin who once said there is no final crisis of capitalism unless there is an alternative. And I think he was right on that, actually. Uh, and I think that the system is resilient. It has the capacity to pull out of it. It has the capacity to wreak havoc on its people. But if the people take it, it will carry on doing it. That's the answer. It's, there's, no going, there's not going to be any spontaneous collapse of the system. Um, and now we have, related to this economic crisis, a political crisis, of which I have dubbed the crisis of the extreme center. We have country after country in Europe and the United States ruled by an extreme center, center left or center right. They do exactly the same thing. Bush and Obama. Blair and Cameron, Sarkozy and whoever's going to succeed him. In Germany, you often have national coalition governments. And this is now creating a, a, a situation where young people are getting more and more alienated from this uh, extreme center. And extreme because it has pushed through extremist economic policies linked to wars abroad that many people dislike, but which they can't change, regardless of who they elect to power. And that's a dangerous situation politically. Let me tell you something. The program of the extreme right in France, Marine Le Pen, the program of the Dutch neo-fascists, even the Italian, they are horrible on immigration and Muslims and all that. But if you look at their economic program, Marine Le Pen, the leader of the French uh, national, uh, ultra-nationalist, is cleaning up her act. She's not saying the things her father was saying. And basically, when she asks, what do you believe in? She says the French Republic, but a French Republic in which the state controls the heights of the economy. So when she's asked, she says, health, education, water, gas, railways, all these should be controlled and owned by the state because these serve the needs of everyone else. The combination of chauvinism and xenophobia and a radical economic program, David, is a dangerous one. And the question we have to ask is why is not a single centre-left Social Democratic Party using these demands, which are after all historically their demands? They're not doing it. Uh, so, but the right has realised much more than the left on what needs to be done in that part of the world. So it's... Uh, it's a problem. The booms and busts will carry on. I don't think that the this financial economy based on zombie capital 
can last forever, but they will make changes as time comes. They will be, you know, depending on what happens in the country itself. I mean, as you know, the capitalist system can vary from being a social democratic system to being what we've got now. Uh, social democracy they found necessary to compete with the Soviet Union and say this is a democratic version of what they're doing. But now they don't need to do that because the Soviet Union doesn't exist, so they've you know, come out tooth and claw. We'll do it because we can. You know, we'll exploit you till you drop dead because we can. We'll make wars because we can. And that's the system uh, we live under. And I think young people should really, you know, study and appreciate it. With the infamous boast of Maggie Thatcher, Tina, there is no alternative. What do you see evolving in terms of uh, some kind of coherent response to the existing system? <clears throat> there is always an alternative. Uh, and the fact is that it can come into being if people struggle for it and fight for it. And what we don't have today is any political party fighting for an alternative. That's why we, I say we're in the grip of the extreme center. But movements arise, movements develop. They have done in South America. They could do in parts of Europe. They might even in the United States one day, if not immediately. Uh, or in the Arab world. So I see what is going on now in different ways as the harbinger of what is yet to come. And when it comes, it will surprise people too. But you have to struggle and fight for it. I mean, don't forget that this whole neoliberal program, which has set in place and taken over the world, was started in the, I think, 40s and 50s by Hayek and others. Um, in a tiny group of thinkers called the Mont Pelerin Society, in which they used to meet and discuss these ideas, and everyone used to laugh at them and say, these are crazy people, uh, including all the Keynesians who were running the world with the help of social democratic style governments. They are, these guys are mad. Well, mad or not, they took the world. And so we have to start thinking very seriously about alternatives. And in my opinion, the central pillar of an alternative has to be the intervention of the state to own and acquire property without which a social welfare state is no longer possible. It's not just funding it through taxes. That period has long gone. The state actually has to be a player in the economic system in order to fund a proper health, education, public transport system. If it doesn't do that, you know, the, things will go from bad to worse. And so this struggle to reinstate the state in the thinking of people is very vital. And this is why neoliberals and some anarchists fall into the same trap that we have to, the state can't be used, we've got to devise policies without the state. The neoliberals are being dishonest because without the state they couldn't have achieved what they have done with the state backing them, with the state pushing through deregulation laws. And, and bailouts and subsidies. And all that, yeah. bailouts and subsidies. I mean, this state which was considered so evil, they finally went on their knees before it, the bankers and the financial speculators, and said, dear state, please help us, we're in trouble. So, you know, a number of people have said that the state is being used to create a socialism for the rich. But, you know, the real needs of ordinary people are what are far more important. So I think that things like this have to be done. And in Britain, one is discussing the idea of creating committees, groups in every single city with a charter of ten crucial demands to mobilize people who are not even political, but who will see the strength of these demands and have a march of a million people or more on Parliament to deliver this remonstrance and say, this is what we want, which none of the parties inside here are delivering, and not just as a 
part of propaganda, but to create something. This can be done in every country in the world, actually. I mean, you don't have to immediately build up new political parties, but you have to create the basis for them. And the fact of these occupations, even though some of the young people involved in them run away from the idea, should be to build something that lasts. After all, however nice it is to live in tents for a few weeks in the park, and it's very, you know, nice, attractive thing to do, it can't last for too long. You, The kids will get tired and go back to what they were doing before, and then it'll be back to business as usual. And we need to create institutions which always challenge business as usual. What about the efficacy of elections in terms of affecting change? Does, does, does the election of Obama in 08 uh, finally disabuse people of, of that possibility? Well, it's, you know, in countries where that can happen, it is very positive, as in South America, where government after government is elected to bring about change. And it doesn't change everything, but it begins to implement that. Obama was never interested in change. You know, his slogans were totally vacuous. Change we can believe in, which in effect has meant no change at all. Uh, or yes, we can, which is one of the most vacuous slogans I've heard in an uh, uh, election anywhere. But it's become popular. You know, the funny thing of American dominance is that you see these pathetic little European politicians, even though they don't speak English, ending with saying, yes, we can, yes, we can. <laughs> and you say, what world do you guys live in? Do you ha are you totally out of touch with your people? The question is, yes, we can what? Yes, we can challenge the powers of capital. Yes, we can stop making wars. No. Yes, we can enhance civil rights. No. Yes, we can lock up whistleblowers. Yes, that's the change we believe in. We lock up more whistleblowers than Bush. We'll release less people from Guantanamo than Bush. I don't think that the lesson of Obama has gone through totally, by the way. I mean, I think lots of people still have illusions, and so they find excuses for him. You know, that he's, uh, he's a prisoner. This is my favorite one. You know, we have a prisoner of Zender here the prisoner of the White House. Who's prisoner? Guy was, you know, couldn't wait to enter the White House. He'd been campaigning for it for so long, making himself calm, moderate, cautious, post-racial. Post-racial in the United States? Uh, in a country where now the figures of black people incarcerated in prison or part of the prison system through parole networks and hence not allowed to vote the actual number of these people now is exactly the same as the size of the black slave population before the Civil War. This is post-racial America. So, you know, someone has to say these things. Uh, uh, and I think African Americans are realizing that this is the case, but don't want to say it in public. Because he's the only black president or mixed race president they've had. And given the way he's behaved, I mean, the Republicans have now got a black candidate too, you know, running the race, came. And, I mean, he's completely, you know, besotted with the capitalist system. And sometimes people don't like it, but I always say this now, to just break illusions. It doesn't matter what the color of the skin of the President of the United States is. He, or whether it's a woman, uh, you have to judge them not on the basis of their gender or their race, but on the basis of what they do. Because they are not ordinary prime ministers or presidents, they are imperial presidents. And that's a distinction that is very important. You've been a part of many uh, social movements over the decades, both in Pakistan as well as in uh, England. You know that they can take an unpredictable turn. There is no saying with certainty that this will be the outcome. So in this moment of enormous economic upheaval, uh, one could, I think, venture to say that there is a potential for some kind of revolutionary breakthrough. What that might be, again, is purely speculative. Well, uh, look, nobody, but nobody predicted the Arab uprisings. And that shows that history remains very original. 
you can mimic it, you can echo it, but it's very difficult to repeat it. Uh, it finds its own paths and channels. So, I would say that, yeah, virtually anything is possible, but at the same time, in some countries, in Greece, for instance, it would be a relief to everyone if a revolution took place. Really, people would be relieved. They wouldn't care what the structures are. They would just say, help. And people would see it as a relief. But whether the <coughs> people on the left or the masses are prepared to challenge the system frontally is another one. That's a huge risk as well, David. And, you know, I say this after a great deal of reflection, that the Egyptians and the Tunisians and the Yemenis who are still fighting and others won because they were prepared to sacrifice their lives. They were prepared to say, okay, if necessary, we'll die. And when a people loses its fear of death, it can achieve miracles. The Europeans haven't reached that stage yet. They really haven't. And they've got to achieve a bigger miracle than the one achieved in the Arab world of two despots being toppled and others being under threat. Um, so, yes, it can happen, uh, but it depends a lot on the political consciousness of a country and its people. And, of course, political consciousness, too, is never linear. It can go up, and then it can stabilize and be flat for years to come and suddenly the situation changes and it can become go up very fast. And when that happens, you do need some institution, whether it is a popular assembly or a political organization or a party of a new type, to take the decision and with the people and their support and say, now we're going for power. You have to do that. Uh, if you say ludicrous things like we can change the world without taking power, then you know you might as well go into the laboratory and flush yourselves down because you're not going to achieve anything. Just a few more questions. Okay. Um, you were featured in Oliver Stone's documentary South of the Border and uh, more recently in the forthcoming Showtime series, The Untold Story of the United States. Uh, what's it like working with a Hollywood director and why did you decide to do these, uh, to take part in these uh, <coughs> adventures? Well, I mean, you know, it's not what I normally do, David, as you know, but uh, Oliver is slightly different. He always, in some of his political films, puts in something that is startling. It, it makes you think. And whether you agree with him or not, he, he has that capacity in his films, you know, his trilogy of films on war, the Vietnam War, very powerful and moving. And he's learned how to subvert that Hollywood style into doing something which is actually different. And I say that this comes partially from the fact that Oliver is half European. His mother is French. And so he sees, he sees the world slightly differently, and he's a great fan of a lot of European cinema. Uh, so that is one thing about him, which is why, even before I knew him, I, I enjoyed you know, some of his films, the ones I saw. And I he's also a, a Vietnam combat veteran. He is a Vietnam combat veteran. We talked. I said, you know, Oliver, when you were... He said, when were you in Vietnam? I said, well, I was in North Vietnam. Uh, under the bombs which the United States were dropping on that country for six weeks in 66-67. He said, at just the same time as I was fighting on the other side in South Vietnam. So I said, how people change. And he did change. That experience, you know, marked him for life and he saw through all the pretensions of, 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 um, of that that war and made these films as a result. Look, uh, how we met up is he was in traveling in South America and I don't know, he was in Paraguay and he rang me up and he said, hi, is that so and so? And I said, yeah. He said, hi, I'm Oliver Stone. And I said, hi. He said, you may know my work. I said, yeah, I do know your work. And he said, 
um, I'd like to meet up sometime and discuss various things with you. He, he was reading Pirates of the Caribbean. Right? He was reading Pirates of the Caribbean, which he liked a lot because he, uh, you know, he was making the film on South America. And so the next time I was in North America, I flew over to LA and. He actually did the first interview with me on uh, for for the untold history, and that went on for seven or eight hours. That interview on film, and you know Oliver was very struck by it. It was actually a good interview. That's what's published now uh, in this book on history by Haymarket, and uh, Oliver was. Uh, taken by that interview and then he said that's for the untold history but a part of it I'm going to use for south of the border I said okay and then his producer said we're not totally happy with the way the south of the border is working and being edited will you sit down with us and help uh, sort of recut the movie so I said I better see it first so I saw it and it was, you know, very strong in many ways, but it was, there were too many talking heads of people we all know, David, uh, just talking. And not enough of the richness of that experience. So I said, look, what you have to do, you know, keep some of the stuff. It's fine. Politically, it's fine. But as a film, it's not working. And the reason it isn't working is because it's very dull. And so the only way I can see it with the material you've got is to play to your strengths. And your strengths are a Hollywood director not believing the lies he's seeing on his media about South America, hops on a plane and goes and talks to six or seven heads of state within the speed as a period of two to three weeks and then comes back and offers his version to the American people. Simple and that's it. And that's what was finally done and I think that's why what, why many people like the film because it was straightforward you cannot write an essay if you're making a movie you know you, you are dependent on images and you're dependent on what they say so uh, that's how we worked on South of the Border and it's a very enjoyable experience really and many people who wouldn't have come to any didactic film, unfortunately, because some of them are good, uh, came to see this in huge numbers in different parts of the world. And uh, I didn't go to the Bolivian premiere, but Oliver, I think Oliver did. And he said uh, it was the most amazing experience because, you know, to watch the film with 30,000 Bolivian peasants. I mean, I, very few people have seen that. And even though they couldn't, you know, follow English, they could understand the Spanish. But unerringly, they applauded at the right moments, <laughs> which was a bit different from the creepy response in the New York Times from this guy who had a real axe to grind against the left and uh, made a fool of himself, basically, by denying that even there was a coup in 2002 there was no such coup. This is an exaggeration. So when you meet journalists like that from the paper of record, you really wonder what's going on. A coup against Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Yeah, this guy from the New York Times didn't believe that there'd been a coup, leave alone a coup organized by the Americans and the Spanish with the uh, Venezuelan opposition and the Venezuelan media to topple Chavez. He said, no, that was not a coup. So Oliver and I just stared at him. I mean, you know, it was very difficult to have a proper conversation. And he came to us like an intelligence agent with questions which, you know, worked out like a policeman. There was no exchange at all. So they tried to, you know, damage uh, the film here and probably succeeded to a certain extent. You travel extensively, you lecture all over the world, you've been in Indonesia recently, you go to Greece, Croatia, the United States, Canada, and at the same time you're a prolific writer of books and essays. Where do you find the time to do all this stuff and where does your energy come from? Well, my energy comes from a deep belief that one mustn't become idle that if you believe in certain things, you've got to fight for them. And this is the way I fight for them, you know. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I just can't give up on that. 
and I, you know, I try to ration my speaking engagements, but the pressures are really huge now uh, from all over the world. You mean requests for you to lecture? Requests for me to lecture. And sometimes I wish I could just sit in my study and lecture via Skype. But that's, you know, it's not the same. I have done that with an audience in Taiwan. But I can't, you know, it doesn't work. It, it, so people don't like that suggestion. No, and, and you relish the contact. And I relish the contact. I love the question and answer period with an audience. I, I really enjoy that. <clears throat> and always have because it's the you know cut and thrust of political argument and debate which we lack in this world which my generation was used to and enjoyed and thrived on it and that I think is important when I'm working on a work of fiction David I disappear I'd really do cut everything and I just work two months at a stretch then I come back then another two months whatever it takes to finish the novel I write it in total isolation and now the non-fiction books sometimes make themselves, you know, the one you did with me when we did uh, uh, speaking on Empire and Resistance some years ago. So many people have liked this book in different parts of the world and said, how was this written? I said, it wasn't written, it was spoken. And then it was transcribed onto paper, similarly on history. But currently I'm working on a book for Metropolitan Holt on the last empire, which is the United States. Um, and, the, you know, it's likely evolution, it's rivals, could they develop? It's sort of not simply a book which one can do quickly. And I've been researching it and reading up on it, and I'm part of the way there. I hope to finish it next year. But this is now where I'm finding that my speaking engagements are disrupting the work on this novel for the Empire Project of Metropolitan Holt. I am feeling it. So, the, I mean, December and January are light months. In terms of your intellectual formulation, uh, who and what were the, the major influences? And who among the younger generation uh, excite you? Who are the, the younger Tariq Ali's out there? Well, I would hate to describe people as being, you know, like me, because it's, I'm not, it's, they're, they're, everyone have, has their own individuality. But my own intellectual formation was, you know, quite orthodox. I mean, Marx, Lenin, Trotsky from the classicals, uh, then from people who were still alive in the 60s, Ernest Mandel, very important influence on me, wonderful orator, spoke eight or nine languages, very good educator, wrote many, many books on economics, politics, imperialism. One of his books, his little books on the history of the Second World War, is actually a classic because he points out there wasn't one war, there were many different wars within the World War, and what the structure of that war was, the meaning of the Second World War, which I think is a very fine book by Ernest uh, uh, Mandel. Um, Perry Anderson uh, at the New Left Review was also you know, quite an important figure, and remains colleague, comrade. Uh, we have lots of arguments, discussions, we don't always agree with each other, but his work, uh, I think, has really enriched the culture of the left globally, uh, for people who, who read. Uh, it's very beautifully written in a, almost a Baroque language, and it's very, very hard. It doesn't stand any nonsense. So if you look at his essays on Europe, the New Old World, I mean, I'm told that people in Turkey fainted reading his account of how the Armenians had been destroyed. It's a fantastic passage. And uh, a number of Armenian friends emailed me saying the um, Republic of Armenia should make Perry Anderson a national figure and build his statue because no one else in Europe has written like that. So, you know, there are people like that uh, who... I was close to, and people I am still uh, close to, Robert Brenner, another close friend on, on the economics and history at uh, UCLA. Uh, but from the present generation, I mean, 
Look, where our, our intellectual formation is determined by the world in which we live. And the world in which I grew up was a world in which communism and capitalism were battling. However deformed communism was, the idea was still there. I was uh, <clears throat> six years old when the Chinese Revolution succeeded. And I still remember a demonstration I went to, a May Day meeting I went to with my parents in Lahore Trade Union meeting, where the chant was throughout the way, Chin Karasta Lenge Ham Bhaiyo, Chin Karasta. We will take the Chinese road, brothers, the Chinese road. So the Chinese Revolution had a huge impact on Asia, which one must not forget, and still does, if you look at Nepal and the Naxalites in India. That hasn't completely gone, despite the shift in China itself. Uh, and then we had the Cuban Revolution, which was our revolution. That was the 60s revolution, successful in 59, but very much the revolution with which the 60s generation identified. So we lived in an epoch of revolutions and wars determined to crush that. That is all gone. And the young generation that is growing up, or has grown up over the last 30 uh, or 40 years, has grown up in a period of defeat. And that has affected their formation and how they think. I don't blame them at all. That's what happens. You know, no, no generation is like the other. But at the same time, this latest crisis is throwing up young people all over the world who are challenging, you know, and who are asking questions about democracy and capitalism, saying, what do these words mean? They're meaningless. I get it all the time. I got it today at a college in Santa Fe. Young people saying, why should we bother about democracy? Nothing changes. And this is a question which is being posed around the world. So I'm optimistic. I'm uh, optimistic on that. As, as for a younger generation of writers, I think there are quite a few. You know, I mean, I have enormous time and respect for Naomi Klein. I think Naomi thinks very originally uh, and tries to get to the core of the problem in a different way from what is traditional, but that's good. Uh, I like the work Doug Henwood does on Wall Street. I like Greg Grandin's work, you know, unremittingly uh, assaulting the imperialist fortress for its past and present crimes. There are a whole bunch of young intellectuals, or younger than me, you know, from a later generation, uh, who are doing extremely good work. The big danger comes when too many people get caught up in academic language and academic jargon. And that should be avoided like the plague, I think, David. Uh, and it's, some academics do avoid it, but I prefer the intellectuals, younger intellectuals, who are writing outside that framework, because then they don't have to worry about anything at all. They can just say as they please. Uh, so I'm, um, I'm quite, uh, quite pleased, really, and happy with the future in terms of the intellectual left. I think it's secure. And your parents were both uh, journalists, leftists, and activists. Surely they had a major impact on you. Well, I wasn't thinking about them intellectually, but of course, uh, in terms of my own early formation, yeah. I mean, the household I grew up in, as you know, I come from a deeply reactionary family of um, lazy landed gentry. But... Uh, my parents became communists, my father and later my mother. And so our house was permanently uh, occupied when I was young by trade unionists, left-wing poets, painters. <clears throat> the Progressive Writers Association used to meet in our garage for a long time, if I remember correct, every Thursday or Friday. Um, and then we had the other side, the family you know, which one had to visit, though my father was deeply reluctant and said, what well, you must always understand about these people. 
is they're very affectionate and sweet, but they're very stupid. They're totally bereft of ideas, so don't take their stupidities too seriously. I said, no, I don't at the age of 10. So, but I was fond of my family, you know, the, the non-political elements in them, they're perfectly nice people on, on one level. But what had the biggest effect of me was growing up in this semi-Bohemian milieu of communism, poetry, culture, politics, all given an added twist by military dictatorship. You know, who that politicized one completely. The first Marxist reading group we set up at college was during the first dictatorship. And they had, of course, banned it. And our principal said to us, Whatever you do within the four walls of this college, I will defend. And I asked him later, I said, Dr. Naziz, does that include a Marxist self study capital? He said, It definitely includes that. So we had people like that. And they had a big, big influence on me. What I had mentioned earlier was my intellectual influences on me when I came to Europe. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks.